Amen. Now I get to preach. Now I get to preach. I'm pumped for today. We are um, in between series. And so we just finished up our series on dangerous prayers and 21 days of prayers. Um, I just, just I want you to raise your hand if you're in the place. And, and God has shown you, been at work, answered some prayers, done some things in you through this 21 days of prayers that might not have happened if you didn't commit that time to him. Would you just raise your hand high and say, God has done some things in my life. Keep them up real quick. Keep them up. Keep them up. Raise them up high. Encourage other people with what God's doing. Amen. I'm just pumped for, for that. Um, just yesterday, we had our time of Saturday morning prayer. We had about 15 or 20 people up here praying over every prayer request that's out there on the board, praying over our community, praying over our ministries. And, uh, and so uh, continue if you want to. There's uh, more papers you can fill out on, on what you're praying for and what God's teaching you and how God's answering your prayers. You can uh, find those papers to fill out at the information table. You can tear them off and you can actually post them on that board. We'll keep that board up for a few more weeks because we just want to know what God's doing. And so um, if God did do something in your life over the 21 days of prayer, would you take some time to fill, fill out like just a testimony of that? Because it's encouraging to see that. When other people read that, it's, it's encouraging. They say, well, maybe God can do that in my life too. And so, um, and maybe you're continuing to pray. We're going to continue to pray for God to open the doors to what you're praying for. Uh, and so that's, that's one of the things I, I've been just um, learning is um, that God wants us to pray dangerous prayers. And I'm not going to stop praying big, dangerous prayers because we have a God who wants to answer those prayers. So that's what God's been teaching me over the last few weeks. And next week, however, we are going to be branching on and, and jumping into a brand new series. I'm pumped for this. We're going to be preaching. I'm going to be preaching on some assembly required. It's going to be a brand new marriage series. And uh, how many of you know that marriages don't come out of the box perfect, right? You know what I'm talking about? They take some assembly over time. And that's what we're going to be talking about over the next uh, three or four weeks. And so we want all of you to, to come back. I want you to invite some people to join in with you uh, to, to come and experience what God's doing in this place. But also we're all going to just be real, learn, to get, uh, learn about marriage, learn about God's principles in marriage together. And it's not just for married couples. Let me say that disclaimer. This, this is going to prepare all of us and work in all of our hearts, whether you're married or single, whether you're engaged, no matter your age as well. This, this series, especially the first message I'll be preaching next week, it's super important for even teenagers and, and, and uh, young adults to hear, especially as we're looking to prepare for finding the right person. And, uh, and so we want um, everybody to come be a part of this series, okay? I'm pumped for it because I know what God's going to do. And I'm praying for you that you guys are ready to receive what, what He wants to do through this series, okay? And then with that, so it's the right time, we're partnering that with our marriage retreat coming up as, as well, okay? But today, the time in between the series today, I'm going to be preaching on uh, families. We have our parent-child dedication going on today. So at the end of the service, we're going to get an opportunity in the first service to dedicate a couple of families. And in the second service, we'll have the opportunity as well to dedicate a couple of families uh, unto the Lord. And so as a congregation, we get to do that together. But in the process, we're going to learn, uh, as I'm, I've entitled this message today, we're going to learn the right recipe. The right recipe. Now, as we do this parent-child dedication today, um, I'm, just, I'm going to be talking about family a lot. Uh, and, and did you know that family, the family is super special to God? In fact, God created humanity with family in mind. When He created Adam and Eve, remember some of the first commands He gave them, what did He say? He said, go be fruitful and multiply. Like in the initial immediate relationship, he said, here's a family. He created family. He he's, wants family. And so family, children, offspring are, are near and dear to God's heart and the foundational unit of all society. No matter what country you live in, no matter what background you have, no matter um, what people group you're a part of or what your traditions are, the family unit is the foundational unit. And what I believe is that if we are going to be image bearers of God, we're going to transform this world that it starts with our families. It starts with our families. In fact, image bearers of God, that's an interesting thing, but here's what I believe. I believe that God has called every child, including us, 
all of us are intended to be image bearers of God in this world. What does that mean? It's almost like God's called us all, including our children and the children that we raise, that when people look into their life, they're going to be a reflection of God's character and God's love and God's compassion to the world around them. So what we are doing when we are parenting and what we are doing in our family is we are raising image bearers of God who are going to reflect His character and His love to the world around us. (laughs) That's a big responsibility, right? It's a huge responsibility when you think about it, that what we are raising are going to transform society either in positive ways or in negative ways because they bear some kind of image and we're praying they bear the image of God. Look at this verse in Psalm 127. In Psalm 127, the psalmist writes this. He says, children are a heritage from the Lord, like this inheritance from the Lord. Offspring are a reward from Him. Like arrows in the hand of a warrior are children born in one's youth. Blessed is the man whose quiver is full of them. Now, I I like this verse because I'm I'm a deer hunter. And right now, if you know what time of year it is, I love the cold weather because that means the deer are moving and, and uh, hunting is good. And so I, I like to hunt and I like this verse because I'm a deer hunter. I like to bow hunt as well. And this talks about arrows, right? And this talks about the, the emphasis of a bow and an arrow. And here's, here's the pictorial image that, that God is showing in his word. He's like, our children are like arrows that we get to launch out into the world, At some point and through the child-rearing process, we are drawing them back, energizing them, preparing them for one day we're going to launch them to have an impact and an effect in our world. So they're not only a, a reward from God, a blessing from God, they're also one of God's greatest tools of transformation in the world around us. Some of you are administrators or school administrators or counselors or teachers. Do you realize that you're in the process of of drawing back and getting ready to send God's arrows out into the world wherever they go? As a parent, we do that. As other influencers, we do that. As a church, we do that. If you're training up kids in the nursery or the kids' ministry or even just in here in this environment, we're doing that. And it's a process and God wants us to take that process um, and take a great responsibility for that process. Here's my challenge today, that parents, that we would be mindful that we need to carefully raise and prepare our kids to be sent out into the world as a tool of God to transform this world. That's my prayer today. So we're going to read through a passage of scripture in Deuteronomy chapter 6. And I believe this is one of the foundational passages for for the family in Deuteronomy 6. I'm going to give you some some, uh, context to what we're about to read, um, because we're going to read quite a bit of Scripture. But here's what's going on in this this, uh, passage here. Um, Deuteronomy takes place, and and probably Moses wrote this, this book, this record of the account of the people of Israel and their journey. When Moses writes this, and the time period that this is happening is at the very beginning of Deuteronomy, the Israelites are camped out on the banks of the Jordan River, fixing to cross over into the promised land that God had given them. You see, the backstory is this, that God, several hundred years earlier, had promised the Israelites, the descendants of Abraham, that they were going to have a land, and that He was going to be their God, and they were going to be His people, and then they were going to be a blessing to the entire world. But then something happened and they were enslaved for 400 years in Egypt. And then God showed up in a big way through Moses, rescued them miraculously, uh, brought them out of Egypt, gave them the Ten Commandments, and then they found themselves in disobedience to God once again and they wandered around the desert of Sinai for 40 years. Finally, 40 years have passed that God is now going to allow them to finally take charge of the blessed land that God has given them. And Moses has all the people uh, stopped on the outside of the promised land, on the outside of the Jordan River, and he gives this final speech. And he says, hey, 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 let's not get ahead of ourselves. We need to stop and think and prepare for where we're about to go. And this is the message that he spoke to them. And I think it's very pertinent to us as as parents and influencers that we stop, we take a breath, and we think what it is that we're actually doing. Okay, so Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 1, 
We'll jump in there. It says, And these are the commands, the decrees, and the laws the Lord your God directed me, and this is Moses talking, to teach you to observe in the land that you are crossing the Jordan to possess, so that your children and their children after them may fear the Lord your God as long as you live by keeping all His decrees and commands that I give you, and so that you may enjoy long life. Verse 3. Hear, Israel, and it's really Moses' way of saying, Listen up, Israel, and be careful to obey so that it may go well with you and that you may increase greatly in the land flowing with milk and honey, just as the Lord, the God of your ancestors, promised you. That term milk and honey is kind of strange for us to read, but it's really this idea that milk and honey were seen as very, 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 very valuable resources in their day and age. And so when he's talking about this land is flowing with milk and honey, it means this land is abundant with all kinds of crazy good stuff that you can't even imagine. That's what he's saying. He says, be careful when you go in there to keep the word and the commands that we've given you. He continues on in verse 4. He says, Hear, O Israel, listen. The Lord your God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. These commandments that I give you today are to be on your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home, when you walk along the road, when you lie down, and when you get up. Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. Write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. And when the Lord, your God, brings you into the land, He swore to the father, your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, to give you a land with large flourishing cities that you did not build, houses with filled with all kinds of good things that you did not provide, wells you did not dig, and vineyards and olive groves that you did not plant, And then when you eat and are satisfied, be careful that you do not forget the Lord who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. Verse 13, fear the Lord your God, serve Him only and and, and take your oaths in His name. And only take your oaths in His name. Do not follow other gods, the gods of the peoples around you. Now skip over to verse 20. It says, in the future... When your son asks you, what is the meaning of the stipulations, the decrees, and the laws the Lord our God has commanded you? Tell him, we were slaves of Pharaoh in Egypt, but the Lord brought us out of Egypt with a mighty hand. Before our eyes, the Lord sent signs and wonders, great and terrible, on Egypt and Pharaoh and his whole household. But He brought us out from there to bring us in and give us the land He promised on oath to our ancestors. The Lord commanded us to obey all these decrees, to fear the Lord our God, so that we might always prosper and be kept alive as is the case today. And if we are careful to obey all this law before the Lord our God, as He has commanded us, that will be our righteousness. So we have this passage of Scripture. I know it's a lot to read today, but I wanted to kind of lay the groundwork for what we're talking about. That on the verge of crossing over into this promised land, Moses stops them for a moment and gives them what I would call a recipe for success. A recipe for success, especially when it comes to our family. Now, Recipe is an interesting thing, and and I was trying to think through some of the things that my wife cooks and what some of the best things that she cooks. And my wife is a phenomenal baker. Like she gets gets asked all the time to bake cakes and cupcakes and stuff for for parties and stuff. And so she has a the most amazing uh, white cake and icing homemade I've ever tasted in my life. Like it is just phenomenal, and. Um, you know, she, she has this recipe that she uses for that, that she, uh, she uses all the time. And so the, the recipe she uses helps her to get to this. But here's the catch. The recipe is not written down. This is what blows my mind. She has memorized it and taken it to heart. Like she knows the recipe. And why does she know it so well? Because her gran- it was her grandmother's recipe. 
And her grandmother taught her mom how to, how to bake the cake and make the icing from scratch. And her mom taught her, and I can guarantee you that Cheyenne is and already is beginning to teach our kids how to make this recipe. She's taken it to heart and memorized it. Now, what happens if she doesn't follow a recipe? Are recipes really all that important? What do you think? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. recipes are super important because the recipe determines the results, right? And that's the main idea I want you to write down today. I want you to get this in your minds, that the recipe determines the results. The recipe determines the results. In this scripture passage that we're looking at, I believe that God gives us a recipe for success, and it is a godly family recipe. And if we follow this recipe, this recipe will determine the results. We can have the results that God promises in His Word. The recipe determines the results. So today, that's what we're going to talk about. We're going to fill in three key ingredients for a godly family recipe. And I'll just give a very, very clear disclaimer. Cheyenne and I do not do these things uh, excellent all the time. We fail many times a day at following this recipe. I just want to be transparent with you that we're not you know, challenging you and asking you to be perfect. You don't have to be a perfect person. In fact, there are no perfect people and there are no perfect parents. But this recipe, if we follow it and put it into place, then I believe that we can see good things for our family and we can have children that are prepared to be launched out into the world. You with me? All right. So here's the first key ingredient to the recipe for a godly family. Number one, that we are to love God First, now listen up because this is for you and this is for me. That you and I, as parents, we are called to love God first. That means us. So we're not even talking about our kids at this point. We're talking about you and I have a challenge and a calling to love God first. Look at verse 4. Here's the challenge it says, Hear, O Israel, listen up. The Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with what? All of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your strength. These commandments that I give you today are to be on your hearts. You get it? Like God is challenging us that if we ever intend to think that we will ever have a positive influence on our kids or on the world, who does it start with? It starts with us. <laughs> The recipe for success starts with us. And God is calling us to love God with our heart, soul, and strength. And since Jesus repeats that, what's some of the greatest commandments? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. This is what Jesus is repeating. I think it's so often easy for parents that we will try to raise our kids better than we are. Like, and that's not a bad thing. We, we want our kids to have the best education, we want our kids to be in church so they can be learning about Jesus. We want our kids to have the best job, so we're going to work on them to, to do that. And so we invest a lot of time in our kids. We want our kids to be on the best sporting teams, the best, go to the, you know, the best sporting camps, and so we invest in our children. But I want to tell you that if you and I, we don't invest in us first, our children are going to reproduce what they see. They're going to reproduce what they see. One of my favorite verses in all of Scripture, 1 Corinthians 11, 1. You can, you can memorize this. I challenge you to memorize this. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 1, Paul says this. He says, follow my example as I follow the example of Christ. Let me just break it down for you. He's a pastor. He's a church planter. And he's writing a letter to this church. And he says, listen, like I write a lot. I preach a lot. I talk a lot. But, but, but basically, just follow me as I follow Jesus. Because if you follow me as I follow Jesus, you're going to be following Jesus. You pick up what he's saying? You see, discipleship, faithful followers of Jesus are caught, not taught. Like discipleship is caught, not taught. They catch what we, what we are doing like a cold. They catch it and reproduce it. So what are they catching from you and from me? What are they catching? Because they, we can be telling them certain things, but if they're not catching the right things, they won't reproduce it. 
And so you and I, we've got to fall madly in love with Jesus ourselves if we want to produce children who are going to be madly in love with Jesus ourselves. If we want our children to have an influence on their peers and on the world, guess what? We've got to have an influence on our peers and on our world. If we want to raise children who are praying kids, we've got to be praying parents. If we want to raise children with big faith, who are trusting God for big things, we've got to express, and they've got to see us express big faith who are trusting God for big things. One of my favorite moments yesterday during our Saturday morning prayer time is Maddie took me over to the prayer board in our time of prayer, and she said, hey, Dad, can we pray for those and those, those prayer requests? And she pointed over there to one of the, um, uh, one of the cards down at the bottom, and uh, she said, this one, I want to pray for this one. And so I read it off. And then I said, okay, well, let's pray. And I got down there on my knee and we held on to it. And she held on to it and closed her eyes. And we, we just prayed. And then she prayed for that person and what they were struggling through. And I got to thinking about like, she hears me pray all the time. But not just does she hear me pray, but am I intentionally walking her through this process and, and letting her engage in that with me? Because it's caught, not taught. And that's an example for us as parents. We need to get good at that. Now, me as a pastor, I get the privilege of telling the one place where I got it right. And I don't have to tell you the other places where I got it wrong. But I'm challenging you to love God with all that you are. One of the other things that we see in the scripture passage in verse 14, there's a warning. He says, do not follow other gods the gods of the peoples around you. For the Lord your God, verse 15, for the Lord your God who, who is among you is a jealous God and His anger will burn against you and He will destroy you from the face of the land. Do not follow other gods. You see what was going on, the context is the Israelites were about to cross over into a land that was filled with many different types of people who worshipped many different gods. And the challenge to them and the warning actually is if you go in there and you're not ready to worship the one true God, you're going to find yourself worshiping a multiplicity of gods and being distracted and spread out and giving devotion to things you never intended to give devotion to and you'll spend your whole life doing that. And we find out that's exactly what happened to the Israelites. They went in and they were willing to allow the other gods to live among them. Initially, they said, oh, sure, there's no way that that's going to have an influence on us. We'll just be around it, no problem. But then over time, they begin to marry people of those other faiths. And they begin to uh, have influence in their families. And a couple generations later, we find out that it said that, that, uh, that, that the Israelites, the entire nation, neither feared God nor knew God. Man, that is a scary passage of Scripture. The same people... The same people that saw God bring them out of Israel or bring them out of Egypt and part the Red Sea. Like they decided at some point to say, yeah, that's the, we could worship that God who rescued us after 400 years of slavery. But there's all these other gods too. Let's worship them. Like you would have never thought that would have ever happened, right? But it did because they weren't careful to protect themselves to worship the one true God. Now you and I, We live in a world of a multiplicity of gods. And I'm not just talking about Muhammad or Islam or or Buddha or Krishna or any of these other gods that that are worshipped in other religions. I want us to really focus in upon what are some of the gods that we encounter today. Here's a definition of a god for you that I want you to take to heart. Is this. A god is anything that consumes or monopolizes your time, energy, or money. Because I could ask you, are you and your family worshiping another God? And you would say, no, (laughs) we're Christians. But then when I ask you about this definition, and you read it, a God is anything that consumes or monopolizes your time, energy, or money at the expense of, of following God, the one true God in your life. So I could have added that. What would you say? Are there gods in your life that you're yielding yourself to? And remember what you yield yourself to, your children or follow. Are there gods in your life that you are yielding your family to with your time, with your money, with your experiences, with your energy? Are there other gods, lowercase gods, they're not 
like God, but they are gods in our life because they consume us. They own us. Are there gods? And so the question I want to ask you today is what gods are in your life that you need to put away? You see, the Israelites, what God called them to do, to do is He called them to go into the new land and to tear down all of the altars and all of the temples and all of the places that are worshiping these other gods. And for you and I, if we allow those things to stay in our life, here's the thing, we will find ourselves following Him. They will have an impact on us. There are gods in the lives of your kids and your teenagers and even your young adults that, that there are gods in their lives that you've allowed to live alongside the one true God. You've allowed it, and I've allowed it. And what we need to do is we need to take their minds and their hearts back and say, you know what, I'm sorry it's going to be painful, but we're going to destroy this. We're going to get rid of this. We're going to take this out of our life. We're going to, we're going to make a decision to be intentional about following the one true God. What does that look like? And so there are things in our lives that if we're not careful, we'll find ourselves worshiping. God wants us to be careful. Here's the second recipe today. The second ingredient to the recipe is this. Teach your children. Notice how I started off with love God first, because that is the first command. But the second command is now to teach your children. Look at verse 6. He says, These commands that I give you today are to be on your hearts. They're to be on you first, and then... To impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home, when you walk along the road, when you lie down, when you get up. Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads and write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. Now there's a lot of contextual um, stuff going on here. The Israelites literally were doing this. They were literally writing the words of God on the door frames of their houses. They were literally binding them on their, on their arms. What does that mean? Is that The Israelites would make these leather straps they called phylacteries and they would wrap them around their wrist and they would kind of have these things that they would um, have just as a reminder of their prayer. And they would have these boxes, literally these, these straps, and these boxes they would place on their forehead that have the scriptures in them, little, little scroll of scripture. And, and, and it, they took this literally. Now, I don't think we need to take it literally like that. But there's a whole lot in the principles that you and I need to get from this today. Literally, what, what, what God is telling us, He says we are to teach it. Teach these commands. Teach the Word of God to our children. To repeat it. The word is repeat. And really the idea is to engrave it upon our kids. Think about that. The aspect of engraving something. It brings a memory back to mind when I was a kid and my, my family, we would take a vacation up to Colorado in the summer. And there were those, um, we call them quakies, but they're really aspen trees, I think. These white bark trees. And if you carve into those trees, you can literally make a mark in those trees that will be there forever. Now, I don't know the legalities of that or if that was doing something legal or illegal for the parks and recs. I don't know, but my dad gave me a knife and, and I remember it very vividly because when you experience pain, you remember things. I remember slicing my hand up really bad. And uh, so I remember that. But I also remember carving my initials and my name into several trees. And if I were to go back and look at those trees today, my carvings would still be there. And I know this because my father-in-law, he hunted up there ever since he was a kid. And when he took us to hunt up there a few years ago, he showed us trees that he carved his name into as, a, as a, an adolescent, like 10 years old. And his name was still there, bright as day. And here's the thing. In the same way, we need to be engraving the things of God and the words of God into the lives of our kids because it's going to last. It's going to last. What are we engraving on the hearts of our children today? Real quickly, it talks about not only just te- times of teaching. So when we think about teaching, you and I think about, well, let's sit them down. Let's read the Bible. Let's pray together. Let's say a prayer and amen and that's it. Like, let's do it in the morning. Let's do it at lunch. Let's do it at night. Right? Like we think of that like, like set times, but, but the scripture is not implying just standard times of teaching, which I think we should do, but it's actually implying every day in every way. Every day in every way. 
Notice how he covered pretty much everything. He says, he says when you sit and when you stand. When you, um, he says, when you lie down, when you get up. He says, when, you, um, when, you're, when you're at home and then when you're walking on the road. So like, it covers everything. We need to redeem our routines. We need to redeem the time that we spend with our kids. Some of the most valuable time with you, that you spend with the kids might be times at, at the dinner table. Some of it may be times in the car when you have a, a, uh, their attention. You know, you, you've, you've uh, captured their attention because you, it's just you and them. Redeem the routine. One of the kids, I, I saw this uh, this year, is that there, was a, there was a parent taking his teenage son to school. He's probably 14 or 15 years old. It was in the morning. Teenager was sitting in the car seat, or the car seat, he didn't have a car seat, seat sitting in the, in the seat next to him. And uh, he was driving and the dad had the radio on and I could hear it. And the son had earbuds and he was listening to his own thing. And they were just focusing on the road, weren't even talking. And it just broke my heart. I'm like, what an opportunity to invest. I'm not, I mean, I've been guilty of that. I mean, we play movies in the car with my kids, so it's not like we're perfect. But I'm just saying that there are times in our lives that that'd be a great example of maybe for that five minute, 10 minute commute, you just talk about your, their life. Maybe you could say, hey, what are you going to face today? How can I pray for you? Let's pray together. When you pick them up from school, what's one of my favorite times, pick them up from school. How was your day? What happened? And then I'm able to help them to process the good things, the bad things, the hurt, and to be able to see it from a godly perspective. We need to redeem the routines in our lives, teaching them God's word in specific times, but also there are times when we can speak God's word into their situations. We need to be looking for those. God will give us those times. As parents, if you're looking for it, God will give you those times to speak into the lives of your kids and to speak God's truth into the lives of their kids. And so that's my challenge that we need to be teaching our children. Here's the final thing. The final thing to write down, the final ingredient is this. We need to remember and recall often. Remember and recall often. Look at verse 20 for a moment. It says, in the future, Moses, people of Israel, in the future, when, you, when your sons ask you, what is the meaning of the stipulations, decrees, and the laws the Lord our God has commanded you? Tell them. Tell them. How many of you know that kids ask a lot of questions? <laughs> they ask a ton of questions. I, I, can, I, I know that from experience. Uh, Madeline, my five-year-old, and even Luke, uh, my nine-year-old, they ask a billion questions a day. I remember, uh, I was, I was uh, researching several years back, how many questions do kids asked? And, and like in the course of a day, they asked hundreds of questions. And we know this because they actually took a GoPro and put it on the kid's head. And they just followed them around the day as the kid was just talking. Like it was like over 200 questions in a single day this girl had. And I'm like, that's Maddie. I know that. Kids ask a lot of questions. Some of them are, are just you know, kind of like just observation questions, funny questions about, about life, you know, the, the, t, the key questions that we think about, funny questions like, is there a Santa Claus? Is there a tooth fairy? You know, and, and like the last questions about the day, like, um, like, you know, we go on visits to, to grandparents' house, like, why does grandma's house smell so bad? Or, or, you know, Maddie's like, can I get my ears pierced? What about a tattoo? Can I wear makeup? And, and Luke's big question that he always asks is he's always like, well, why? And so we'll give him an answer, and then he'll say, why? And then we'll give him another answer, and we'll say, well, why? I mean, it just goes on for eternity. And eventually, you know, I always thought it was really lame when parents said, because I said so. But, man, that's like my final straw. Like, if I say, because I said so, it means I'm done with this conversation, okay? I've told you every reason I could possibly think of. So kids ask a lot of questions, and they're funny. But kids also ask real serious questions in life. I mean, some of the questions that I field, uh, f- uh, fielded in my life are um, like, why do I need to obey you as parents? Why do I need to obey you? Why, why should I be nice to my sister or to my brother? Or why do I have to forgive them whenever I stole their toys or hit them or said that mean thing? Or um, I feel that this question, like, what am I supposed to do when people say mean things to me at school, when the kids at school don't like me? When they say these things, um, why do I have to go to church? <laughs> Who would have thought that from a pastor's kid? <laughs> why do I have to go to church? Who is God? What is he like? How can I hear from God? 
I can't hear him talking. How do I hear him? Like, and they ask serious, real questions. Those are just some of my own examples. But kids are always asking questions. And, and what are we to do? We're not just to ignore them, but we are to tell them why. Tell them why. See, if we really look at this situation, God did all these amazing things in the lives of the Israelites, and then they forgot about God. Look real quick over verse 10. It says, When the Lord your God brings you into the land, He swore to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, to give you a land large, flourishing cities you did not build. Listen to this. Verse 11, houses filled with all kinds of things you did not provide. Wells you did not dig. Vineyards and olive groves you did not plant. You notice what he's saying? He's like, do you realize you didn't do any of this? Like none of the good things in your life that you're inheriting, you did not do that. I did. And this is God speaking. You didn't do it. I did. He says, when you get there, verse 12, be careful that you do not, what? Say it with me. You do not forget the Lord who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. You and I as parents, we are so quick to forget what God has done. We're so quick to forget and be distracted about all kinds of things in life. We forget. We forget. And we forget, when we forget about who God is, we forget to tell Him, or tell our kids who He is. We need to remember and recall often. Here's the thing I, I know. That God has done things in your life that are amazing. He's answered prayers. He's walked with you through difficult times. And you need to be transparent with your kids appropriately about what God has done. You need to be telling those stories and recalling them often because our kids not only learn through teaching, they learn through stories. They're going to remember those things of what God did. And it's going to be a part of grooming them and growing them so they are the arrows that God wants to launch out into the world. We need to remember and recall often. Now, this is the recipe that God gives us. The question is why? So why? Why should we do all this? I want to give you one final thing. Look at the very first verse. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse, three, or verse 1. He says, These are the commands, decrees, and laws of the Lord your God directed me to teach you to observe in the land that you are crossing the Jordan to possess. So I'm teaching you things. I'm giving you these things. Verse 2. So that. Say that with me. So that. So that you, your children, and their children after them may fear the Lord your God as long as you live by keeping all His decrees and commands that I give you. And so that you may enjoy long life. Hear, O Israel, and be careful to obey, so that it may go well with you, and that you may increase greatly in the land flowing with milk and honey, honey, just as the Lord your God, uh, the God of your ancestors, promised you. See, there is, there are results for this recipe. God says we do this, we invest in our kids, we raise them up, we remember and recall often. We love God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength, so that our kids. And our grandkids will grow up knowing God, will be blessed in what they do, they will be prosperous, they will be protected, and they will see victory in their lives. That's what we want. That's what we want. The recipe determines the results. I want you to bow your heads and close your eyes with me for a moment. As we finish up here today, the recipe determines the results. God, I pray that you would help us to invest in our families by first investing in ourselves. Lord, that we would learn to love you, to know you, to love you, to honor you with our lives in such a way it would be contagious to our children. God, I also pray for us, Lord, that you would help us all to raise our kids, to teach them, to guide them, to remember what you've done, and God, to talk about the things that you've done to the people and to our kids around us and Lord, to invest in them. And Lord, we pray that you would raise them and lead them to be image bearers of you that transform the world around us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.